and then keep some time during the day. I'd like to begin by just introducing myself. My name is Melanie Newport, and I'm working in the Infectious Diseases and Global Health part of the medical school here in Brighton and Sussex. And I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting. Thank you all for coming. It's nice to see a good turnout. And um, this conference this year is all about doing global health in the context of crisis, conflict, and disaster. I just thought it's jointly hosted by the University of Sussex Centre for Global Health Policy, by the University of Brighton, and by Brighton and Sussex Medical School, which, which is actually a joint venture between the two universities. Um, and I just want to give a bit of a background as to how we've kind of all come to be here today. Um, it was sort of noticed that the, the global health is kind of becoming a much more important uh, aspect. People are thinking about it, talking about it on the agenda, both nationally and internationally. And so there's the opportunity to um, to get involved and do and, and have some and make an impact really on improving health around the world, particularly for the poor and disadvantages, disadvantaged communities. And it was noted that there are a lot of people uh, working in global health, but not really in contact with each other within the university. And Peter Eggleton, who is then head of School of um, Education and Social Work, was charged with trying to bring everybody together, initially within Sussex University, but of course we all had contacts with other institutions, the University of Brighton, the Institute for Development Studies. So this group has actually become a wider group of people interested in global health more generally within this Sussex area. And we really wanted to form a platform to bring people together to network, to develop programs and projects, and also to provide a sort of a platform for um, people as they're getting together, networking, sharing information and knowledge. And we've organized a series of seminars. Um, so we have three seminars a term now with one outside speaker and one inside speaker. So that's kicked off. And all the information for this can be found on the um, website at the um, Center for Global Health Policy. And uh, we've also decided to hold annual conferences. And we had our first conference last year, and this is called Talking Global Health. And again, we, we brought together a group of people within the sort of academic institutions here locally, but also people from outside that arena, from non-government organizations, from other institutions. And we had a really interesting meeting, very good turnout, lots of networking, lots of interest, and I think people have stayed in touch since. And we thought due to the success of that meeting, we should definitely follow up with further meetings. So this year, we're talking about doing global health, and we've chosen as our theme, crisis and conflict. And I just want to thank Laura, um, who was at the reception, I'm not sure she's here, but she's put a fantastic amount of effort into organizing this, bringing us all together. Um, so thanks to Laura. I'm now going to hand over to Stefan, who's going to say a bit about the, how the day is going to be structured and what we hope to get out of it. Great. Thanks. Thanks, ma'am. My name is Stefan Elby, I direct the Center for Global Health Policy at the University of Sussex. And I just want to take a couple minutes to talk you through the day and then also introduce our, our chair for the morning session. Um, what we try to do in terms of the design of the day is really kind of mix things up a little bit and give you a variety of different kind of formats and styles uh, to explore this theme with. So in the run-up to, to kind of lunch, we will have a set of about five more traditional presentations covering this theme and based on research that, that's being done uh, at Sussex, Brighton, BSMS, uh, and so forth. But we'll also mix things up a little bit with uh, some more kind of shorter five-minute snapshot presentations which again will give you an additional flavor of some of the work that's being done uh, by academics, by organizations uh, in the area. We'll also have a generous coffee break uh, mid-morning. Uh, we have a nice long uh, one hour uh, lunch as well. In the afternoon then, uh, we're gonna, after lunch, kind of briefly come back together in this room and then break out for the breakout sessions. And thank you to those who, who have signed up for the breakout sessions where we can explore the kind of the five main presentation themes in much greater detail, but be an additional networking opportunity and an attempt to kind of explore some of these themes uh, in more depth. At the end of the day, we have the keynote presentation by Anthony Costello from UCL, who's going to be talking about global health, climate change, and resilience. And then we'll round it all off with a very nice uh, wine reception and entree as well. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, the kind of the day ahead. The morning session up until lunch, will be chaired by Lynette Laundes from the International AIDS Alliance. Uh, I'm very pleased that Lynette has accepted the invitation. Lynette has brought high level leadership to the International AIDS Alliance for many years now. She's the de Deputy Executive Director at the AIDS Alliance and also the Director of Field Programs. One of the great things about kind of researching global health in Brighton and Sussex is that we have organizations like the International AIDS Alliance on our doorstep that we can talk and collaborate with such institutions. 
Lynette is particularly a good choice, I think, for chair, uh, because before she was at the International AIDS Alliance, she also worked for the Red Cross, and she was also deployed in the field uh, in that capacity, both during the first Gulf War in the early 1990s, and also in the Great Lakes region, I think, and during the Rwanda crisis of the mid 1990s. So I know from talking to Lynette that some of these issues are very, are very close uh, to her heart. So we're going to with the, with the speaker's consent, we've, we have asked them to be quite draconian with the time management, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in the sanctity of coffee and lunch breaks. And, uh, my number one goal is to try to, to, to preserve those today, so Lynette has said she will help me uh, in, in doing that. There are, of course, many additional opportunities over coffee, over lunch, and also uh, in the breakout session to follow up any themes uh, that you want to discuss further. So, Lynette, are you happy to stay here? Would you like to come? Are you? Maybe if you start off, oh. then I'll break up. Perfect. So let's move straight to our first presentation. So um, I think some of the some of the presentations are going to be are going to be very specific about particular conflicts, about particular crisis settings. My talk this morning is going to be a little bit more of an overview presentation looking at the relationships between global health on the one hand and crisis on the other. And kind of the main message that I want to get across is that actually this is quite a complex and multifaceted relationship. And that's why I've called my talk Global Health in Crisis, Through Crisis, and Beyond Crisis. And this is also how I'd like to structure my talk. I'm going to go through those kind of three permutations. So if we start with global health in crisis, uh, you know, I think the first thing that probably comes to mind, probably the reason why most people are here, is you think of crisis settings. Right? There are all kinds of different crises. Crises are generally characterized by a sudden and unanticipated onset, often creating very rapid and overwhelming demands for medical needs. There are different types of crises. There are natural crises, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes, high winds, landslides. <coughs> floods, etc. There are also more man-made types of crises. You think of industrial accidents like Bhopal, or nuclear accidents like Chernobyl, and more recently, Fukushima. And there are, of course, other man-made crises linked to armed conflict. Countries in Africa, such as Somalia, DRC, Cote d'Ivoire. Also, interventions in Iraq in Afghanistan, the recent uprisings in Libya, the situation in Syria, all generating medical needs in contexts of crises. All these crises are actually quite different, and different crises do require different interventions, but in terms of kind of generic policy challenges that characterize these different crises, there are also some similarities. So they are often unexpected, and therefore there's huge time pressure on decision making. You have to make a lot of decisions, in a very short period of time, often with imperfect information. You don't necessarily know in advance where the crisis is going to unfold, so you don't have local partners necessarily on the ground, or even if you have local partners, you may not be able to access or communicate with them. There can be major issues around insecurity. The Red Cross published a report last year where they looked at only 16 countries in which they were operating over a period of two and a half years and they logged over 650 incidents of violence or threats of violence on healthcare workers or facilities in, in a context crisis. At the worst end of the extreme, you know, we we're familiar with the stories of kidnapping and targeting health facilities. There <coughs> can be huge constraints put on the movement of where you can go in terms of bringing assistance. This could be a physical constraint if it's a natural disaster. It could also be a political constraint if you're dealing with conflict. What this means is often, despite the best intentions, you end up with a kind of firefighting model of providing relief. You do what you can, it's kind of a, a band-aid type approach. It's much more difficult to deal with the longer term structural problems and the same structural problems that actually predispose countries to being particularly vulnerable in times of crisis in the first place. So this, I think, is the most immediate kind of meaning of doing global health in crisis. But it's not the only way to think about this relationship. We can also go a little bit more to the macro level. If you go away from the kind of concrete crisis setting and think about the international political kind of landscape around global health, 
I think over the past two years, there's been quite a profound mood shift within the field of global health in and of itself. And perhaps even a kind of a sense of crisis. There's, of course, that other crisis, the financial crisis, putting huge pressure on budgets, with a very real prospect that the quite phenomenal growth in global health spending that we've seen over the past decade uh, will not continue in the future. We have also a feeling that there's a bit, perhaps, a lack of coordination. You know, that there's lots of new actors have entered the field, the Global Fund, the Gates Foundation, just to name a few. That overall, this is all still fairly uncoordinated, that there's also a little bit of rivalry, duplication. We have both established and new institutions facing their own kinds of institutional crises. The World Health Organization dealing with quite a substantial budget shortfall and quite substantial layoffs in personnel. Global Fund all of a sudden becoming embroiled and controversies around corruption, also leadership issues there. And even where there are quite remarkable successes, such as in the area of HIV and AIDS and the Millennium Development Goals, there's still a sense that there's still so much to be done. For the millions of people that have been put on antiretroviral therapies, there are millions more that still do not have access to medicine. So there's almost kind of a double crisis. There's a crisis of the crisis setting, but there's also the wider sense of uncertainty and unease, I think, in terms of the future but even here, we haven't kind of exhausted the whole array in terms of the relationship between crisis and global health. And for those who think I'm being a little bit too pessimistic, I'm going to give you a different version now of global health and crisis, which looks at crisis not so much as a kind of positive <coughs> thing for global health, but something which is actually can be quite productive. So there is something about crisis which also generates new things, new initiatives, which I think for global health is also quite important. You know, much more kind of symbiotic relationship, perhaps, between global health and crisis. A lot of us are interested in global health out of a kind of basic experience of crisis. If you look at the differences that exist, for example, in terms of life expectancy, 80 years plus in, in uh, wealthiest countries to less than half of that, if you look at per capita health expenditure, seven to eight thousand dollars per capita in high income countries, less than a hundred dollars <coughs> in the forty poorest countries. That is a kind of sense of crisis. And I think that animates a lot of us to get interested, to study, and to think about global health. If you look at the history of the international architecture around global health, World Health Organization, Global Fund, etc., often it is, again, a perception of crisis that leads to institutional change that generates new programs and institutions. Of course, it's also true that many organizations which work in global health do also need donations, charitable donations, uh, and support. And often it's precisely in the moments of crisis where the world's attention kind of turns to global health actors, where you get the big media attention, and often where you're also then get able to get more support for wider global health programs. So that's why I think it's important to think about global health not only as something that is in crisis, but also something that works and evolves through a series of crises. And this may seem like a, like a slightly obscure point, but I would even go further than this, and just kind of continuing with this theme of global health through crisis. I would actually say, as somebody who's been looking at the international politics of health over the past decade, is that one of the biggest changes has actually been the quite deliberate use of a kind of crisis model for doing global health. So one of the ways in which we have achieved much higher levels of momentum in terms of political attention, in terms of funding for global health initiatives is by deliberately playing on this idea of crisis. It was a precursor to this in the, in the early 1990s uh, when the World Health Organization became interested in tuberculosis and a kind of global tuberculosis emergency. Well, in 2000, with AIDS, this was escalated to an even bigger strategy, where all of a sudden they took HIV AIDS to the United Nations Security Council, declared HIV AIDS a threat to national and international security, and you got this big kind of what we call the securitization of HIV and AIDS. And if you look, that has been accompanied by quite astounding increases in funding and aid for dealing with HIV and AIDS. And since HIV and AIDS, this has been a strategy which has become even wider. The World Health Organization now talks about global health security, 
There's issues around pandemics and other big crises, all of which are very politically actually very useful in terms of getting funding and resources uh, for global health activities flowing as well. So I think, again, thinking through the relationship between global health and crisis, crisis has actually been quite a useful tool. It's been quite deliberately played on by people working in global health in order to get more attention on global health. And if you combine these two things, if I can be a little bit provocative perhaps, if you combine this thinking about global health in crisis with thinking about global health through crisis, perhaps the kind of the moment that we're at now in terms of global health is precisely the moment where the crisis model of doing global health is itself in crisis. What I mean by this is that we've had this really energetic 10 years you know, where, we've, where we've gone to making global health a high politics issue. We have all kinds of strong scenarios about the worst things that could happen if we don't deal more with global health issues. But now, due to the financial crisis, due to a variety of other factors, this <coughs> is itself losing a little bit of its power in terms of animating global health. And I think that's why we're seeing a kind of sense of unease, a little bit sense of uncertainty, even amongst global health actors, about what the coming decade will bring. And so it's also, perhaps then, time to reflect about what can we think about what global health would look like beyond crisis. Well, I'll just do by way of conclusion is outline kind of three scenarios for you where I think we could go from here. <coughs> perhaps the most idealistic scenario would be a kind of system of universal global health care. And I can see some people are smirking in the audience because it is quite an idealistic aspiration. But if you kind of think, well, what do we really want when we're doing global health, right? The kind of the, the basic motivation is this kind of unfairness in terms of access to health care that, that people have around the world. And really, the only thing that would solve that is some kind of universal system. The, pro so the problem is that within the UK, just do something like the NHS, for example, you're probably actually quite a strong institutional apparatus. Right? There's, a, there's a state. The state has the power to, of taxation to take resources and to make it compulsory to have national insurance and to redistribute resources so that health care can be provided at the point of care irrespective of your ability to pay. The reason this is quite an idealistic scenario at the international level is because there is no world state that can back up this kind of system that could enforce kind of universal taxation, redistribute this stuff. In fact, I think there are very strong political dynamics in the international system, which would fight very hard to prevent a world state from emerging. So I think this is kind of, universal health care would generally be a scenario beyond crisis, but unfortunately I think it's politically not very likely in the near future. Second scenario is to continue with what we basically had over the past 10 years of what we call global health governance which is the idea that you can direct and have global health activity even without a kind of central coordinating state. You can kind of marshal together states, non-state actors, civil society organization, international organization. You can still have goal-directed behavior without a kind of central uh, state to coordinate all of this. I think this is a much more likely scenario, but for the reasons that I've already talked about, I think this is also a scenario that's coming under pressure. Because a lot of it required quite heavy financial commitments. <coughs> which are looking a little bit more uncertain. There's a lot of uncertainty about the strength of the American state in particular and its influence uh, in global health. And I think because there's also an inherent tension in the kind of crisis model uh, in terms of sustaining itself. Right? You can have a crisis model for so long before people kind of almost get crisis fatigue and move on to other issue areas. So I actually think, although we've had global health governance for 10 years now, this model is also going to come under a little bit pressure. Which leaves us with a third scenario, which many in the room would probably think is the least attractive scenario of all. But I think there are actually a lot of pressures pointing into this. I call it back to the future. But it's basically a system where actually provision for health will actually be increasingly again kind of locked into a state-made system where states will be forced to take care of the health of their own populations. It'll be different from what we had before in the sense that the international system is changing. Countries like Russia, India, China are rising. There are others, Brazil, South Africa. So it'll be a kind of more multipolar system 
And I think what this means um, that although we, you know, this is probably not what we want to hear in global health, wouldn't necessarily be a complete disaster for about, you know, one thing is a lot of these countries are quite populous, even modest improvements in health in countries like China or India, for example, could have huge health benefits. But it will mean that we will need to think a lot more, I think, in terms about how health fits into the political systems of these key countries, how health fits in with the diplomatic strategies of some of these countries, how it fits in with their foreign policy. A lot of these countries are now also beginning to use health as a way of moving into countries such as Africa and so forth, much as we saw during the Cold War, in order to generate new programs and influence. This is, I think, not the world that we want to move into as a kind of global health community, but it is perhaps one that is coming. And on that, I'll try and end there. Great. Thank you, Stefan, and you can <laughs> this morning we've got a 20 minute slot so that means if the presenter like Stefan is uh, good enough to finish in 15 minutes it gives us five minutes for questions so we've actually got about seven minutes so Stefan thanks very much for presenting on crisis working in crisis leveraging crisis for development and thinking about what that means for global health going forward into the future so who would like to um, start off from the floor do we have some questions Reflections, things you're perplexed about. <coughs> yes, please. Okay, Carol Williams from the University of Brighton. Um, Stefan, I was very interested in your sort of uh, discussion and sort of uh, ideas towards the end uh, and there, uh, and um, I just wondered where you felt the private sector fitted in, because you're talking about the language of health, and perhaps a lot of us in this room come from sort of public health backgrounds, but. Uh, when we talk about health, there's also the sort of the, the treatment aspect, and um, yeah, just wondered about um, how you saw or where kind of the private sector and that division between public health and treatment type health fitted into your model discussed there. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, that, that's a fascinating question actually because if you if you also go back to our theme about crisis, my my intuitive feeling is that the crisis model does gear things towards treatment quite a lot. I think, you know, in terms of the, the, the balance between public health and, and kind of treatment or prevention, <coughs> if you want. Uh, because the crisis model has this sense of urgency attached to it, there is a kind of almost, you know, discursive tendency, I think, to encourage a treatment approach. And if you look at the securitization of HIV and AIDS, for example, it was clearly linked to the rolling out of antiviral medications. Even in other diseases, that's not unique to this, you know. If you look at pandemic preparedness, another great crisis model leading to the stockpiling of antiviral medications, vaccines, this kind of stuff. So there's, I think there is a kind of treatment bias, I think, uh, in the crisis model. Um, but one of the really interesting things about the, uh, about, the, uh, pharmaceutical, about the private sector, of course, also the pharmaceuticals, uh, and their huge changes are going on uh, right now in terms of the future of production, generics. India, again, one of those, I was talking about the rise of India, and this is, again, in terms of the private sector involvement in global health is beginning to manifest itself by India quite aggressively challenging patents on, on medicines. Again, not just in relation to HIV and AIDS, but now also for NCDs and, and other diseases. So I think huge changes, including in the private sector. But the private sector is always quite resilient, and even Western pharmaceutical companies are now realizing that the threat from generics can be managed by investing in generics. Anyone else? Yes. Um, yes Max Cooper, Brighton and Sussex Medical School. Can I just ask about your um, thoughts about Alma Arta and why that didn't lead on to significant changes in universal healthcare provision and whether that's actually going to, we've actually learned anything from that? I think, um, again, if I can kind of answer, it's a great question, but if I can answer it through the, through the crisis model, I think, um, and you know, I, I can't go into as much detail as I would like, but again, I see the crisis model in part as a response, <coughs> not perhaps to the failure of Ahmad, but, but to the inability of a kind of human rights framework to mobilize sufficient support. So I think there's a, I don't want to use the kind of a Faustian kind of 
thing that you have to confront when you work in global health, you know, our natural inclination is to go for human rights, but it's the same with HIV and AIDS, and there's very good reasons why this is important. The problem is if you really want big scale up at the international level of health healthcare provision, whether it's preventative or treatment, you need that high level political attention. And that means you have to begin to somehow think about global health, not just in terms of a, a kind of charitable or a kind of human rights approach, but also how you tie it in with the core interests of politics, government, and economics. And this is, I think, where the crisis model comes in. And I think you can actually see that, in some respects, the crisis model has to do things that Alma Ata could do. But there is a Faustian bargain to this. And I mean, very interestingly, for example, again, in the case of HIV and AIDS, when HIV and AIDS was securitized, there were there's a lot of unease also because of the fear that the kind of security language could be, be quite unpalatable and generate new threats to human rights. And it, you know, so there's, there's something about the nature of the international system that produces this kind of very difficult tension. And there was a question at the back. Yeah, my question to ECL. Um, I, I thought you made a really important point about crisis, real crisis, and artificial <laughs> constructive crisis. And having been a campaigner and used the word crisis a lot, uh, is it does have a mobilising uh, effect. Um, I, I, I think it's an artificial crisis we create. A, we've had boom time in global health over the last ten or so years uh, compared to other development sectors, um, and I wonder. Um, I wonder, partly, what's driven that, and whether you have any comments on the actors involved in it, because we've seen this also incredible explosion of diversity of groups involved in what can happen in that area. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. Um, and I think it's one that. I would struggle to answer at a kind of level of generality, which would cover all bases. Because actually, once you get into detail, you see that the different prices and you know the pandemic crowd is different from the HIV/AIDS crowd, and there's you know there's all kinds of different prices, uh, which which. Um, so I think the best answer I could give you, unfortunately, is one is where we kind of go, go, go case by case and look at it. I mean, in the case of HIV/AIDS, Lynette can tell us a lot about the kind of actors that were you know in, involved in, in in producing that change. Uh, for other for other prices, there's <coughs> huge institutional interests in terms of particular uh, organizations trying to position themselves at the center of global health using the language of prices. So I think it would have to be a kind of sector by sector, uh, I think. But I think what they all face is right now is the issue of, of prices fatigue. I think there's a sense that we're not quite sure what comes next, how long we can sustain the crisis. One more question, if there is one. <coughs> yes. Uh, Tony Ronnie Graves, I'm an MSC student here. Um, my interest is Tanzania. We've, we've developed a country there that's donor dependent. Uh, at the moment, everybody, all the, the global health initiatives for HIV are uh, slowly withdrawing. There's no test kits, the drugs are drying up. The, um, there's a whole country where um, the mission hospitals are taking away their funding, the churches have had enough, they're putting their money into education instead of health. Can we stop making the same mistake again of building up countries with all this done dependency and then just leaving them high and dry? I don't know. And, and, <laughs> I know you laugh. I mean, this, look, you pose it as a question, but this is the question. Right? This, uh, I'm not sure anybody has the answer, but the fear that we all have is that we have created this dependency. And it's true, it's not just Tanzania, there are many other countries which are almost entirely dependent on outside aid in terms of either the health or, or, or development uh, kind of provision. In the case of HIV and AIDS, it's particularly serious because you, you can't put people on the, on the medications and then, and then take them off again. So, um, you know, this, although what I talked about today was in quite general terms about the crisis of the crisis model, it is a very serious. And, and, and real problem. And I think everybody right now, probably including the AIDS Alliance, is thinking about how to position themselves in these kind of new, new realities and try to, to keep going with what has been coming so that, so that people don't come out from this because it would be a disaster if they do. But short of the universal health care, right, which is 
I know everybody laughs. You see, it's, it's, it's totally utopic, right? But what else can you do, right? You can have global governance, but it's so messy. There's so many issues. There's so many actors. Unless you have the kind of crisis model to get all these people together, it's hard to get sustained global governance. And that crisis model, I think, is in crisis. I think that's an interesting point to leave the session, but to keep that question, which is a really important question, very practical, very simple, enormously complex and difficult to find the answer. But if we can keep that thread in our minds throughout the day, I think that, that could be helpful in the, in the bigger picture. We're going to move on now, um, and I'll ask um, Melanie to come back, Professor Melanie Newport, Professor in Infectious Diseases and Global Health, who's going to be joined in her presentation by Dr. Gail Davey, reader in Global Health of Brighton Sussex Medical School. And their presentation this morning is how does conflict shape neglected tropical diseases and the responses to them? Thanks, Thanks very you. much. Okay, well, I'm going to begin by giving an overview of the ne neglected tropical diseases, and then Gail will focus very much on a particular case study looking at one disease in particular. Now, the neglected tropical diseases, they're a group of chronic, mostly parasitic um, diseases that are common in the world's poorest uh, groups, the so-called bottom billion. And some of the features are, um, as I say, mostly parasitic, uh, chronic, complicated life cycles for these uh, parasites, and also the worms, for example, can live for a long time. And there are included now some non-infectious diseases, and podoconiosis is the disease that Gail will be talking about a bit later. Um, and sorry, this list here is basically the, the 20 diseases that the World Health Organization has on its list of neglected tropical diseases, but it's by no means comprehensive. But the most important unifying feature of these diseases is that they are diseases of poverty. Um, and that quote, I think, sums up from the World Health Organization the challenges um, when dealing with the neglected tropical diseases. Now, they're not necessarily fatal. Uh, they are stigmatizing and they cause, dis they cause a lot of disability. And so, for example, if you look at the burden of disease as assessed by the Disability Adjusted Life Years, neglected tropical diseases are second only to HIV AIDS within the um, context of communicable diseases. So a huge global burden but neglected. I'm going to just tell you a bit about a couple of the diseases, just very briefly. Um, and one of them, the first one, is schistosomiasis. Now, this is a disease that is contracted through contact with fresh water that has um, schistosom schistosomes within the water. And the snail is an important part of the life cycle. And uh, the, the larva get in through the skin and then migrate to parts of the body and develop into these adult worms that then mate and lay eggs for very long periods of time. And there's obviously a constant cycle of reinfection uh, with every contact with water, and it leads to chronic infection and uh, liver disease that uh, you can see here's a young child with an enlarged liver and spleen, and causes other sort of consequences such as uh, bleeding from the varicose veins within the gut, basically. Uh, now, obviously, if people did not have to do their washing in infected water and did not have to wash themselves in such water, they would not get schistosomiasis. So access to clean water is actually a fundamental um, issue for this neglected tropical disease. Uh, likewise, there's a disease called trachoma, which is an infection of the eye. So it's a, it's a bacterial infection that leads initially to inflammation of the eyelid there that, that leads to scarring and the eyelashes turning in which finally leads to corneal scarring and blindness. It's transmitted by flies, and this is a sort of very <coughs> typical case, uh, all these flies that are attracted by the secretions from the eyes and the nose. And again, if, if this child was able to clean its face properly, or have a clean face, the flies would not be attracted. And also access, as well as clean water, access to sewage disposable is a huge um, problem for not just trachoma, but other infections such as the soil transmitted helmets. Um, so although there are treatments available, actually just getting the basics of sanitation right would be a major advance for these um, diseases. Now, having said that, in the last five or ten years, there's been major advances in the control of neglected tropical diseases. Private-public partnerships are directed by the World Health Organization. There's now a network, and all, all the, um, the an individual disease control networks have actually joined forces to develop these mass treatment programs because there are treatments available for a number of these diseases. Um, and this map here 
uh, shows that the sort of the distribution of the seven most common neglected tropical diseases, you can see the association with poverty, not surprising that a lot of these diseases, the burden is born within the African continent. Uh, but there are now four drugs that are being rolled out to treat these seven diseases. And as I say, there's been some successes. So one, for example, guinea worm, has almost been eradicated. There's just a pocket now in South Sudan in terms of eliminating that disease. But you can imagine the complexities of these mass treatment programs, the logistics of delivering them in this kind of resource-poor setting. And I want to move on now to discuss a bit of the, the impact of conflict on this. And... Um, if you look now, we've got this map here showing the burden of disease. If we then look at this map from uh, the World Mapper website, um, it basically tells you this is where most of the people who are affected by conflict are living. And with this World Mapper program, what they do is instead of plotting the map of the world according to the geographical size of the country, they take a parameter. So then there's hundreds of different parameters that they've looked at. But if you look at injuries and deaths, civilians as well as non-civilians, you can see again that the burden is here in, in Africa, in the African continent. Okay. And how does this conflict impact on neglected tropical diseases? Well, in a couple of ways, a few ways really. There's environmental destruction, which can lead to things like the increase in vectors. A number of these neglected tropical diseases are transmitted by mosquitoes and other insects, so it can affect the, um, the ecology of the environment in which people are living. Disruption of public health programs, so for example, these mass treatment programs cannot function um, and often related to that is the destruction of infrastructure. So healthcare facilities, roads, sanitation, all are affected. And also preventing the ability or the capacity to do research in an already kind of neglected area for research itself. So you can see it, it's a complicated uh, picture, but many factors um, will influence this. Uh, Conflict-related um, issues will impact on neglected tropical diseases and their treatment. Um, and just looking at this in more detail, we have this cycle, if you like, of exposure, whether it's to a parasite or, uh, in the case of podoconosis, it could be soil, leading to disease, and you get repeated cycles of exposure and disease. And there are factors related to conflict and those uh, features on the previous slide that lead to things like unclean water, poor uh, shelter, um, overcrowding, and migration. People, a lot of um, displaced people, refugees, um, who are subjected to overcrowding, uh, reduced access to preventative care such as bed nets and malaria. And in the meantime as well, there are factors that make the person more susceptible to getting infections, uh, for example, malnourishment and reduced access to treatment uh, through their health systems. And interestingly, people when they migrate, if they're migrating from an area where a disease doesn't exist, such as malaria, to an area where it does exist, because they have no immunity, they're much more susceptible to severe disease. So all sorts of um, factors actually contribute to whether an individual then goes on to get neglected diseases. And I just wanted to finish with one example just, uh, of how this is all uh, fits together with conflict in a particular disease, human trypanosomiasis. Just some data really to support the previous slides. Um, and this work, um, the authors collected data on um, sleeping sickness, uh, trypanosomiasis rates in African countries since 1974 for a 30-year period. And trypanosomiasis had almost been eradicated sort of by the end of the 60s. Um, and then a lot of countries post-independent developed states of <coughs> conflict. They matched uh, the, the prevalence data for the, uh, for the sleeping sickness against conflict data that they derived from a database um, in Uppsala. And this map shows it's got the, we've got the background sort of distribution, background prevalence rather, of sleeping sickness. And these circles represent areas where there were clusters of disease, so hot spots where there have been sudden increases and sustained increases in sleeping sickness. And then match that against, and, and the majority of these, so Angola, uh, the Democratic, uh, the um, yeah, DRC Congo, Uganda, the Central African Republic, and Sudan. Um, these four areas, they were able to show a direct link between conflict and these high rates of um, sleeping sickness. Interestingly, in sorry, sorry, not in, in Central, the four, sorry, Angola, DRC, Uganda, and Sudan. Interestingly, the Central African Republic, although there was no conflict at the time there, the cases all actually mapped to the border areas where refugees had crossed from neighbouring countries where there was conflict. And this, these uh, tables here, just as the graphs rather show, the same information but in a different uh, presentation. So where there's no conflict, minor conflict, or major conflict, and this is just the number of cases of sleeping sickness of these, and you can see the, the correlation there. And also with the, on a political terror scale, so this is actually measuring state versus the population rather than kind of two fighting sides. 
So that's a, a kind of a very brief overview. It's a big subject, so I've kept it sort of very broad and general. And Gail is going to now come and tell you about specific disease, podoconiosis. Thanks very much, Melanie. So I'm going to carry on, and I'm going to take the chance to focus in on one particular country, which is Ethiopia, and one of these neglected tropical diseases. Now, of course, what Melanie didn't say is that most of these neglected tropical diseases have names that are impossible to pronounce. The one that I've got involved with is called podoconiosis, and I'll probably use an abbreviation like podo for the rest of this talk. What I'm going to do is actually pick up quite a lot from Stefan's earlier talk and try and link crisis both with the emergence of disease and then with the shaping of the response to the disease in a particular context. And I'll do that through the lens of Ethiopia and one particular neglected tropical disease, pedicomiosis. Now, that rather grainy image there is uh, Jonathan Dimbleby. About uh, 40 years ago, he was one of the first people to take uh, footage of uh, the, the famine in 1973 <coughs> in Ethiopia. Two years ago, he visited Ethiopia again, and there was a documentary series, and in fact that's where that particular <coughs> frame is from. But I'm going to actually show you um, a little bit of his original footage. Actually, let me try. I've got to re-log in again. Sorry about that. Yes. That film exposed a tragedy that led to the deaths of 100, maybe 200,000 people. The imperial dynasty was overthrown. I'm going to, uh, the reason I showed that clip is to illustrate really the end result of a number of different factors that have all fed together to um, come to that particular crisis. And in Ethiopia, that crisis was led to by many centuries of very hierarchical rule, a succession of emperors, um, often with very little contact with their people, um, substantial population growth, there had been rapid uh, population expansion uh, through the early 20th century, very heavy dependence on subsistence farming, and unreliable rainfall. Uh, this combined to mean uh, there was extreme vulnerability to food shortages. Now, I hate people who talk about Ethiopia and show a picture of the famine, because that's a really lazy um, just generalisation <coughs> or caricature, really, of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is about much more than that, but one of the reasons that I did show that, and I will show it again, is because that particular, that particular clip links these two issues very, very closely. I'm going to go back to the beginning. This is the earliest footage that I've come across that actually shows this disease, podoconiosis. Um, Jonathan Dumbledore didn't realise this. I've had a correspondence with him since. Um, when the cameraman went down that line of, of um, seated people, he went past the, the cameraman went past um, an individual with pedicaniosis, a swollen foot, um, in an area where this disease is endemic. And so this clip sort of links these two issues, crisis and one of these neglected tropical diseases. So I'm going to go back to... what happened immediately after that film was shown. It, it was one of many things that actually catalyzed the overthrow of the imperial regime. And um, the very next year, 
a military regime came into power uh, called the Derg, which means committee. This was very little better for the people of Ethiopia than the former imperial regime. And um, in 1991, um, a group of uh, really guerrilla fighters from the north came to power and at first formed the transitional government, which is now the federal democratic government of Ethiopia. Now, it's not all roses still, but there are some pretty <coughs> notable achievements that have come really through those years of crisis. There's economic transition, movement from central command economy to uh, a market economy, although that looked like a reversal of that uh, towards the end of last year. Then a number of development uh, plans with lots of acronyms, and it's possible that some of these had an effect on, on GDP, and it's reported that uh, per, uh, per capita, well, no, that GDP is about 11% at the moment, which is rather, you know, favorably, which compares favorably with that of China and other uh, um, economies. There's a number of uh, health sector development uh, pr plans in process. There are four, and we're on the, um, the third of those at the moment. And I think one notable um, part of the health sector development plans has been the health extension programme. That has been uh, a vehicle, really, to deliver prevention and health promotion to 80 million Ethiopians in rural settings. And I mentioned two particular achievements um, over the last six years, um, one being um, training and um, release of 34,000 health extension workers. These are women who work at a grassroots level, they're trained in a gebeles of 5,000 people, and uh, about every month they're meant to have contact with every family in that area. And a, a second sort of notable achievement was the distribution of about 20 million bed nets um, over the period of about two years. And people assessing, the, the Malaria Partnership uh, assessing that distribution of bed nets put, put this success down um, to leadership, partnership and pragmatism. A sort of unusual combination that seemed to have emerged within um, this government and probably also has its roots in their time as guerrilla fighters uh, in the north. Um, they there, there is a very, very strong leadership shown, and um, some of you may have read uh, in this week's Lancet, Mela Zanawi uh, has a comment um, in that he's the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. He's not frightened to lead in global health in that sort of way. Um, partnership. Um, Again, there's no real hesitation about partnering with appropriate organisations. And then there's pragmatism. Um, there are people in Ethiopia who are prepared to say, well, actually, we, we can't do this on our own, and we're going to need some help here and here. That's a little different to this question about dependence. I think when a country is saying, OK, you can come in to do this, but not that, then maybe there is more control and sustainability. But let's, I'm not going to do questions on this because we have a whole afternoon. Yeah. Um, so Ethiopia is now emerging from crisis. These are the sort of this is the sort of picture that shows um, rural um, uh, economy. About ninety, no, eighty-six percent of people still working as subsistence farmers, small town life, um, bartering and, and uh, trading goods, and um, a, a large and still population growth to about two point six billion, two point six percent. So where does uh, this particular disease fit into this? Well, um, my feeling that it is that it arises from the intersection of these three elements, rural populations with very little political voice, heavy dependence on subsistence farming, and then, of course, inability to afford shoes. Podokoniosis is a type of leg swelling that arises when people are exposed long-term to a particular type of clay soil. Um, as Melanie mentioned, uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't kill people, but it disables and it stops them being productive. So again, we have a cycle uh, by which uh, the disease means that crisis is perpetuated. But I want, what I want to finish with is uh, to show you how some of the responses to crisis may actually mean that the response to control of some of these neglected tropical diseases is possible.
Now, for the example of pedokinesis, control is relatively simple. It's about education, people understanding what the disease is and where it comes from. It's about foot hygiene, washing feet, um, improving the skin's barrier function with an ointment or oil, use of bandages where necessary, and the use of shoes and socks. This isn't a rocket science, and as a result of Ethiopia's reaction to previous crisis, I believe that the country is well positioned to deli deliver prevention and care for a fairly simple um, a control programme like this through the existing network of health extension workers. There's a strong leadership that can direct those workers towards individual diseases or to integrated control of diseases, which is what we're aiming for. Secondly, um, partnership is, is something that um, will be necessary to integrate this sort of control with other um, control programmes where information and education is necessary and maybe shoes are important as well. And then, of course, an element of pragmatism is necessary um, using the para-health services that are available, maybe shoe companies and outside resources, to assist where Ethiopia isn't yet at the state to, um, uh, to provide everything that's required. I get to leave it there for fear of running over time. And um, we, in the afternoon, can carry on and look at more issues related to conflict. These are some questions that we might like to consider in the afternoon, and I probably haven't left enough time for questions there. That's absolutely fine. You can